You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. So now it's time for one of the most popular panels at every options conference, the Exchange Leaders Panel. It seems like every year we have a different number of panelists. This year it's five. So please welcome Andy Nibo, Director of Exchange Vertical with Burton Taylor International Consulting and our panel of exchange leaders. Great. Well, uh, thank you uh, all uh, for joining us this morning. I know it's kind of early in, uh, in Arizona, particularly after last night. Um, so uh, I think everybody on my panel was out of there quite early or, or didn't carry on. So it's good to see uh, everybody so chipper. I'd um, like to obviously thank OIC and OCC for putting on this event as well as Host Exchange and IZ and ICE. Um, great turnout this year, great venue. So uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to my panel here with uh, I don't know if these guys really need an introduction. Shelly Brown, Ed Boyle, Kevin Kennedy, Andy Lowenthal, and Ivan Brown uh, from their respective exchanges. There's fewer chairs this year, a little bit of consolidation going on, um, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, I was going to take one chair away before we get out of here, but uh, someone threatened to just walk away, so that wasn't a good idea. Um, but uh, you know, we, we heard a lot of different comments from the panelists and the speakers over the past couple days. Um, with respect to our industry and what's going on in our industry. So there's a, a number of topics um, that we're going to touch on today. Um, but I also wanted to touch on a couple of the comments that uh, Henry said this morning earlier. And, and uh, in the past, I've, I've uh, been accused, I guess, a little bit of being a little bit too negative about what's going on in our industry and some of the trends and challenges we face. So. Uh, today I'm going to start with some of the good things, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate what Henry said about the volumes. Uh, you know, the volumes are, are very strong given our environment, given our volatility environment, uh, given the uh, the makeup of the investor community and, and how they're looking at uh, at managing risk in this in this continually upward moving bull market. Um, you know, volumes are pretty healthy. We're, we're seeing a you know uh, I think Henry's numbers were about two and three quarter percent overall growth rate for the industry with, with strong growth uh, in index products and ETFs. Um, some challenges there that we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, you know, the investor experience, particularly on the retail side, is, is, uh, is incredible. Um, you know, the, uh, the tools they have at hand, the prices they're able to get, uh, the information they're able to pull off the screens, uh, albeit for the more active uh, issues. Um, is, uh, you know, is, is really the envy of the world. Our, our, the resiliency of our, of our marketplace, uh, the financial uh, capacity of our marketplace is, is the envy of the world as well. Um, so things are good, vol's low. Um, that'll come back, I think, I don't know, with, uh, with kind of all the articles in recent days. Um, but we also have uh, a bunch of challenges, and, and that's kind of what I think we're gonna focus on a little bit today. Uh, complexity, there's 15 uh, medallions out there right now. Um, there's some new initiatives being launched, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, do we really want one exchange similar to a vertical kind of model we see in some of the futures markets around the world or, the, or other derivatives markets? Uh, I don't think so. I think competition is good, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, the, the regulatory environment um, is a burden on all market participants, but exchanges seem to be at the center of all this uh, and, are, and are facing a lot of costs as well. Um, and then there's a small challenge of the, the rapidly disappearing community of market makers and, and what does the industry need to, need to do to get these liquidity providers and, and paint the screens with quotes uh, back in action. And, and uh, there's been some negative articles, but also some, some interesting articles. So, you know, obviously Two Sigma acquiring Timber Hills operations was, uh, was kind of a, a vote of confidence in our markets. So there, there is activity and there is interest in being in our markets. 
Um, so that, uh, you know, that's kind of what, uh, what we're going to talk about today, and, and I'm going to throw it out there um, to, the, uh, to the panels, um, the complexity, right? We have 15 exchanges. Is, is that too many? Is it just right, or do we need more? And I'll, I'll, whoever raises their hand first, and they go, whoa, man with six medallions. <laughs> so it's a great question. It's a question that we hear constantly. And I would tell you, I would, I would give a different answer than maybe Henry gave when he said, I'm not sure that you need you know, more, than, more than this or more than that. I, we run six, obviously, and I, I'm really proud of, of the value that we've added on five of them. MRX, the newly dubbed MRX, which was Mercury that we acquired, is something that we did not set out to say, let's have a sixth exchange. But since we acquired it, we do have plans for it. We do think we're going to add value and be innovative in that space once we're through our integration. So there's a lot more to come there. You've seen us take Gemini and turn it into a 5% venue. So I think we have credibility when we talk about that. But to your question, Andy, do we need six? Or do I need six? Do we need 15? I think if they're adding value, so just to give you a little bit of an example, I mean, Philex and ISC both have a very large full suite of product. They both cater to institutional flow, but they are very complementary. They're really not duplicative. They have a lot of different facets to what they do. We, we are engaged with our clients, so we know that certain clients like price time, certain clients like pro rata, certain clients like customer indicators, some don't, some like customer priorities, some want to have a specialist or an LMM on more than one venue, some don't have exposure to any, and we give them the opportunity to have that. So I feel comfortable with the number of medallions that we have. I think you know, theoretical value for us is six, and we have some work to do on the sixth, but, but I'm, I'm happy with my medallions. I agree with everything Kevin said. The uh, reality is some of the expansion is driven by customer demand. Uh, I will take the blame or credit, as the case may be, for opening the 15th exchange. But we try to get into another space. There's multiple allocation models across the market, whether it be pro rata or price time. There's multiple fee models, there's maker taker, there's taker maker, there's conventional fees. So when you, you look at all those combinations, while there are 15 exchanges and they're all competing overall to provide best execution, we are providing a lot of different market models and gives you the opportunity to pick and choose where it's best for you to rest your liquidity or take liquidity. So I'll, I'll speak as an exchange that's only got one, which is a, a uh, I think we're the outlier right now. As a matter of fact, I know we are. Um, and that doesn't mean that that's not a consideration for opening more, because I agree, I actually agree with you guys. The, this is really the exchanges, the way we answer to multi-tiered markets. While access is, is fair and open for everyone, this is how you cater to the different client bases. Kevin referenced it. You look for each of those pieces that the clients like, and you put that exchange model together. We've done it a bit differently. We've got a pricing model that, depending on the counterparty to who you're trading against, does that for you. So it's a way to try to keep that exchange fragmentation and that exchange growth down while answering to those, uh, those different market structures or rather the, the client needs as they go forward. Um, fragmentation, you know, overall, I think we could all, if we were in a quiet room, agree that isn't healthy for a market because of the cost that it starts to add and the burden it starts to add. But let's face it, we're in the securities markets. This is how they're regulated. This is what they are. The genie is out of the bottle. It's not going back. Andy referenced, you know, should we look like a futures market with a single, ex a single uh, monopolized market? That's not going to happen. It's not part of the securities. It's not how they trade. Uh, the SEC is, doesn't have a, a wand they can wave to say who's going to be a winner and who's going to be a loser, and it's not their job to do that. It's the marketplaces. The difference is, is we have to start to solve the problems for fragmentation and come up with the proper ways we can interact without, while staying competitive, so staying away from that collusion that is always spoken about, that we, you know, we can't get together, Henry talked about multiple strike listings, we can't get together and start saying, here's how we're going to you know, delist strikes or, <clears throat> or structure a, a market. We have to use the regulatory environment and the structure behind that to come to agreement on those type of ter terms. So it's a very difficult thing to do very difficult thing to address. So fragmentation is here to stay. We have, we have four exchanges. Uh, three of them have very unique market models. CBOE, of course, is the traditional with, with the trading floor. Uh, C, C2 is a maker-taker pro rata. 
Uh, DZX is a make or take or price time. And then EdgeX is kind of, right now, is, is probably most aligned with the, our CBOE model. But it's given us an opportunity to look at, uh, at what we can do and bring in, in some new innovation. Um, we've had several customer meetings over the last couple of days asking uh, market participants what innovations would you like to see on exchange, what is not in place. And for an exchange to have four medallions like we do, that gives us the opportunity to protect our, what we have and provide service to the, to the customers that are using our exchanges. But with that fourth medallion, it gives us some flexibility to, to try new things. And I think um, part of the spirit of, of this industry is to innovate. I think having that fourth medallion allows us to do that. I guess at the sake of throwing my uh, hat into the ring here on this, um, you know, I think the important distinction that, that we have to make here is the fact that there's always a trade-off between the marginal cost and the marginal value that each of these incremental things in isolation affords the industry, right? And largely, you know, we haven't seen a huge amount of differentiation in, in terms of the new offerings, right? Competition is extremely healthy to the extent that it drives efficiencies for the industry, to the extent that it makes it possible for all of us to, to innovate and, and be more efficient. But I think you know, we, we are in some respects, and I think this is thematically true of what's been said over the last couple of days, is that we're at somewhat of a tipping point, right? So I mean, there's no cause that's more important to the options industry right now than the preservation and, 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 and advancement of the displayed quote, right? And we're seeing, obviously, that dynamic be challenged at the moment just given the fact that things are so fragmented. And it's not simply just the number of exchanges, it's also the number of products, right? And having to think strategically about, okay, well, when we're delivering value, how, how are we doing that, right? And from the perspective of, you know, normally market forces would dictate what provides value and what doesn't, but, you know, the, bar you know, the barrier in terms of the, lit you know, the litmus test as to, to what, you know, what is required just to connect to a new exchange is, is fairly low, right? Given the fact that obviously there's a notion of linkage, so. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm buying this. 15 exchanges. Um, obviously, the uh, you know they're built for a reason. You guys are for profit, right? It's it's uh, the the member only kind of concept has gone away. Um, so you build new exchanges based on demand from your customers. So they're, you don't just invent these things. You got market makers and, and other uh, order flow providers that come to you and, and want to do things a little bit differently. I mean, at what point does an exchange medallion with less than 1% or, or, you know, whatever that number is, um, cause too much friction or tax on the industry? Is that, uh, you know, is that part of the cause of fragmentation? Is this, you know, putting too many uh, burdens on market participants? So, you know, are we in this world where we're going to see five more exchanges or even more exchange. I mean, you're the, the Shell, you're the newest entrant with, the, with an exchange license. So we're responsible for 11 and 15. Uh, but when we looked at opening a new options exchange, we looked at what could we do different? What could we do to improve the experience for the members? And the, the industry, it's, it's all about providing best acts and taking care of the customer. But to do that, in the options market, we're a quote-driven market. So you need to support the market makers as well. And we tried to look at it from a per perspective of what can we improve for the industry? What can we do to help the market makers provide more liquidity? So we tried to build an engine that was faster than what was available. We tried to build better risk protections in. We tried to build the obvious air rules actually into the trading, trade match engine. We built a state-of-the-art operations center with a great trading ops team. And it's all about <coughs> delivering better product to the client. Yes, we were late coming in the game, but we believe that we really brought a different type of technology and a different experience for the market makers, which should promote better liquidity for the customers. Is it, I mean, is it all about me too having the same functionality that uh, your competitors have, or, or are there new mechanisms that the exchanges are looking at or you guys are exploring to kind of help the liquidity conundrum out the there? SEC the SEC makes it so difficult. We just, filing the rules for a new exchange, we basically copied rules from other exchanges to some extent, added a little bit more detail. Every time you add more detail from the SEC's perspective, it's something new and novel. And I can't look and say, well, it's what he does, and it's what he does in three of his exchanges, and he does in two of his exchanges. That's not an acceptable answer. So it's very difficult to bring out new functionality because you have a huge resistance point at the SEC. I think one of the big misnomers about new exchanges, new venues, fragmentation, as everybody you know, talks about the cost, and Henry also referenced that. 
that, and there's cost, there's absolutely cost of, you know, co all your co-location, your hardware lines, your building of your technology, on and on. But that's, it's a significant cost, but it's not the cost that market makers are really concerned about. The cost they're really concerned about is open order risk. They've, they know they've got operational risk, they know they have market risk, they know how to handle all that. The problem they've really got is I've got quotes on the screen and okay, we quote 900,000 series now, I've got whatever you decide you're gonna make, let's say you're quoting 600,000. As you add each exchange, the open order risk of those orders that are sitting on the screen is your real risk because when you get swept, whether it's a, uh, a market event, whether it's timing, however it happens, the market makers have a they're more than willing to trade on their quotes. So many people say, oh, market makers just wanna back away. It's not true at all. They do not wanna back away. They wanna trade on their quote, provided their quote is generated off of what the current, the, the most latest information is. So risk protections for market makers, I think are probably the key we need to focus on moving forward as exchanges. And will it matter if we have 50, you know, it would, yeah, would it be nice if we had two, three, four? Yes, absolutely. Does it matter if we have 15 or 20? No, it doesn't. What matters is how we're gonna be able to give market makers the, the ability and advantage to be in the marketplace. And it's not an, over, an advantage over the other market participants. It's simply the ability to respond to the information in a timely fashion and to be able to trade when the information hasn't changed adversely prior to them being allowed to update their quote. That's, I think, what we really need to move forward with. I, I think we really need to just figure out a way to affect change. We, we talk at these conferences about the same thing on and on. And I think, you know, one of the benefits of being sort of in a slow period and, and reading in the press about how bad things are in the options industry, that I think it's an opportunity to improve in market structure, to rework the regulatory landscape, you know, to think long term for this industry, where are we really going? Yeah, it's, it's great. We're hyper competitive and we can defend and create a new market model, but we're not really being innovative. We complain about the regulator, but it's not the regulator. It's the regulatory framework that we built. They're just enforcing the rules. And I think it's time to think all of that through. I think it's time to sit down, and I think we can actually work together if we're transparent, if it's maybe SEC sponsored, sort of an options MSEC, if you will, and figure out where we need to be for the next five years as a market. We're not gonna solve anything in six months or a year or two years. But we should have a plan. We should sit down and think about, Henry alluded to the fact of maybe delist the bottom thousand. Well, I certainly wouldn't delist the bottom thousand. There's not much trading there. But that's an opportunity to maybe think differently and create better market structure where I think competitively, none of us have a whole lot to lose in the bottom thousand. But maybe we can start to make structural changes that will, will improve this 14 and a half million options a day that we're doing in multiply listed equity options that we've been doing for four years now. So we talk a lot, it's time to really throw a stake in the ground, work with the regulator, maybe commit a committee that they can put together and work together in a transparent fashion. But we have to affect change and I can pledge to you, we'll take a very strong leadership position on that and work with the regulator, with SIFMA, with STA and our fellow exchanges. And we're gonna take that very, very seriously going forward because we need to modernize market structure. We do, and I, I agree with Kevin. And one of the things that I hear reoccurring throughout this, the meetings and the conference is the customer experience is great. You know, the, 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 the EQ is as good as, as it's ever been. When a customer does come in and trade, they get a great fill but compared to the, to the published market. But what we don't know, and I think one of the re issues that we, we really have to look at is who isn't coming into the market because of what is on the screens. When you see these, these very wide bid asks and, and these bottom thousand names, and I think it goes probably way below, way deeper than the bottom thousand, um, people through, um, you know, through the, all the tools that have now become available to them, through the online brokers, through the registered advisors who've adopted our products, but at the end of the day, that quote on the screen is our best advertising. And when the quote on the screen is awful and $5 wide or even a dollar wide and at the money option, near term at the money option, it turns people away. And I think that's the issue that we all have to face and discuss. And I think I agree it has to be done collectively. One exchange is not gonna be able to take the lead on any of this stuff. It's gonna to have to be done with all of the people in this room working together to come up with where we wanna see this market structure be in the next, for the next gen, for the next few years. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I think, you know, when you, when you look at it, investor participation is largely a function of investor confidence, right? And investor confidence is being able to see that displayed quote 
and access it. And not necessarily the notion of when the quote is wide and perhaps you know, the price that you're actually going to achieve is, is quite reasonable, but you, you don't have faith in that because it's not transparent to you, right? And so I think, I think that's the important part. And so when you look at it and say, okay, 50% of the volume is in 22 names, there's no question that obviously that's getting serviced quite well, but you know, building an industry off of 22 names is, is that's a challenging point, right? And so what is it in a name like McDonald's or to Henry's example before Tesla, which is a highly recognized name, but as we saw, the spreads were, you know, fairly substantial, so. Great. You know, you, you talk about the, um, some of the challenges in the, in the bottom thousand strike uh, listings and, and, you know, the lack of screen liquidity or displayed liquidity on the screen, uh, you know will constantly reinforce that there's a lot of liquidity behind the screens, but unless there's trading interest and other structural issues. Um, the, the growth in the index side, the growth in the ETF side, um, I mean, I see some challenges around that, um, particularly given some of the comments that were made on the panel, the millennial panel yesterday, because it, it came across as a very um, passive way of investing. You just put money in the market and let it work. Well, that's index investing, right? It's just putting money in there and just not managing it. Um, with 40% plus of, of activity in the options markets now in ETFs, um, is that a cycle that's just gonna kind of continue to erode market quality in the single stock options? Because if you're trading an index, you're trading an active or a passive strategy, why trade a single stock option anymore? Is that adding to the challenge we're facing as a kind of building liquidity in, that, in, the, in the single names? I think part of that problem is, is price of the underlines. If you're a millennial and you want to invest in tech companies and you're looking at the price of a price line or a Google uh, close to 1000 or over $1,000 a share, those options are very expensive. As, same with the stock. They can't necessarily afford to buy 100 shares of stock. And if they only buy 5 shares or 10 shares, they can't write an option against it. So you've got a problem that you, you, these stocks, for whatever reason, these companies don't want to split their share prices. I think that's had a negative impact on options volume as well as equity volume, but it also has pushed people into some of the ETFs. If you want exposure to the Googles of the world, you can get it through the queues. You can get it through an ETF where they can't afford necessarily to trade the options on a, on a Google where you look at a one-week straddle, it's $25. I think a lot, of, a lot has to do with our margin rules, too, that it's getting harder and harder, um, particularly in the regulatory environment. I mean, if you look at everything, it's not that the, anything is stacked against the retail investor. He just has to become a lot more um, educated on the marketplace. And the, the people who are out there who choose to do that, who trade on all the, uh, whether it's the discount platforms or any other ones, the people who are well-informed and know how the markets operate are more than willing to trade. And they are the guys who understand that while the Tesla you know, spread is, is wide, the effective spread is much tighter. They know that they're gonna get filled. And when they look at that wide quote, it doesn't discourage them from trading. A lot of these guys trade the, uh, in the complex orders. And that's where we see most complex orders are much more uh, priced at, uh, at the relative value versus just you know, going into the marketplace with market orders and things like that. So going back to the ETF argument, I think if we can get more of that education into the single names, we can get them to trade options, but Shelley brings up a great point. These, these expensive stocks, I mean, these are something that's really new to the marketplace in the last uh, 10 years. There was a few of them years ago, but not very many. And I don't know how many, I've got a kid in my office who likes to trade actually, and he really wants to trade the, all of the techs. And he can't, because he doesn't have enough capital in his account. So if we can find better ways to, um, to work on the margin rules, and that's being challenged right now. We could um, we could also help that problem both in, that, in both the equity side, the cash side, and the options side. I mean, just, just <clears throat> so just to think about it though too. I mean, um, w when you look at some of the innovations that have taken place from a technology side over the last couple of years in terms of engaging new users, right? You look at the the advent of robo advising and how that very much simplifies the investing process. You know you know, whatever residual level of your paycheck, just automatically toss it in, you know, into one of those robo funds and it'll be automatically invested. And it's very easy to sort of visualize the outcome and the diversification and kind of what that, you know, what that suite does for you, right? So it, it takes a lot of this sort of mechanical thinking out of the inv investing process. And so the question may become is, so you, you have a, a larger and larger universe of people 
to engage. The question is how do you parlay that also from an educational perspective? It's like, okay, so now you're in the market and you have these, you know, you have these outcomes, you have this diversified fund. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you do something interesting with options? And I feel like from that perspective, at least from you know, a, a millennial perspective, it's oftentimes more interesting to sell the outcome than the construction, right? Because it's all about where does that get me to? And so to the extent that we think about positioning options strategies in that format, that also can help you know, bridge that gap and help you know, try and create a new level of engagement from a different point of view in terms of how to understand that process. So. I think, I think single stocks sort of always been a challenge. I mean, I think we like to gloss over, over the years. We remember when Dell Computer was, was busy, and we remember when, um, you know, Apple was really leading the charge. We don't really have that, that leadership right now from any of our, our single stocks. And, you know, a lot of companies are coming to IPO with the $20 billion number instead of maturing with us as an industry and growing you know, from Amazon, I believe, came public three or four hundred million dollars and then grew to its current market cap within the options industry. That was a big help. We're seeing a lot of this 20, 30 million dollar or 15 to 20 billion IPO numbers. So that doesn't help. You know, we're doing a lot well, though, right? So SPY is, is a very, very good product for us. The weeklies have taken off. We're, it's a very liquid product. I think when you think back to 2007, 8, and 9, this industry, I've said it many times, but earned an A+. plus. We were really resilient. So. We do the same thing on these panels. We like to <coughs> beat ourselves up. But I think it's important to realize we're still a relatively young industry that started in 1973. I think we've shown to be resilient. We've shown to be innovative. You could argue we're in a lull right now. But you know, we're going we're gonna to do well. And we just need to stress you know, a couple of the low-hanging fruit things that we can solve, I think, by working together. The strikes, our curb appeal, which I call our curb appeal, but the spread widths. In, in the right area. So we've seen these spread widths in SPY, they're, they're incredibly tight. And in Pulte Homes, they're wide. Well, I think if Pulte Homes got busier, the spreads would tighten up a little bit. But I think we should work on that. We need to work on spreads. We need to work, work on strikes. And I really think most of all, we need to work on education. I'm not sure that we put the time and the money that we used to in education. And I don't know that we're applying it in the right way to attract millennials or even up to the 30, 40 year old. I, I think we need to look at education overall. Uh, shift gears a little bit. The, um, your clients, your customers, uh, the market making community has dwindled quite a bit over the past few years. Um, what are you guys hearing from other than you know the complexity and, and the too many exchanges, et cetera? What, it, what is kind of what do we need to do to get more market makers involved in the industry? What are, what are the biggest challenges they face? Eighths and quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Back to 19. Um, <laughs> and more trading floors. And more trading floors. We could use those as well. Um, the, the idea there is, I, I think it really goes back to the how do we make the market making business a good business again. I think there's a myth out there that all market makers, you know, they're, they're, they go out and make so much money that everybody is just is extremely wealthy. And if you start a market maker, you're going you're gonna to make a lot of money. But what we've seen is the other side of that. We've seen market makers leaving the business. Um, you know, Timber Hill leaving the business, but then Two Sigma coming back in and acquiring them. I, I think that's a, a great sign. I think there's too much negativity out there today. I think it's too easy to focus on the negatives. I think there are a lot of positives out there. Um, but what I think we really have to concentrate, and I referenced this earlier, is how do we get market making? Market making is a business and it's a service that they're providing. It is not. Um, somebody going to a, a gambling table. This is a real business that we need. Liquidity is the lifeblood of the marketplace. If we can't make the market making business better, we're going to uh, we're going to see a we're going to continue to see erosion in that displayed quote, which is covered in reference is our advertising. That's what we're out there doing. Um, and I, I, there's a number of ways we could do that, and you know whether it's through a committee type structure. But we've got to be cautious when you build those committees, and we've got one on the equity side that you've got a conflict of interest if we use industry participants. So how do we, how do we create a committee that acts like you know, our little NATO that can not only work together so that we can come up with these ideas, but at the same time and punish or enforce bad behavior? That's one of the other issues. We could delist, we could all you know, say, yeah, let's start delisting securities, we delist them, and tomorrow one of us will light them back up. And trust me, we will. Why? Because it's com competition, it's simple, it's easy. Um, we, we have to come up with a methodology to do that. I'm convinced that that's going to be the road to the future. 
Let me just sneak one thing in there because I started that conversation. So I think we get together, it will be a, a large committee with a lot of input and could, could be together for years. But I think one of the things we can look at is what we did with obvious error. So I think if we were to pick the low hanging fruit, like strikes or spreads and, and focus not on trying to solve everything, whether there should be flash anymore or whether quoting obligations should be $5 wide. We can talk about all those things, but if we just pick one or two, I think with a goal of, hey, let's get this done in nine months like we did with obvious error, I think we can start to solve some of those things. Well, we're half done and auctions haven't come up yet, which actually amazes me. Um, there are some things around the edges that we can do with auctions that um, I think would go to the problem that we're, we're discussing. Uh, you know, we heard it, I was on a panel here probably, it, wasn't, it was many years ago about the negative, the negative selection. So the market makers who don't have the dedicated order flow put their markets on the screen and the only time they trade is when, when they feel they're, they're trading against somebody they don't want to be trading with. And I think that's been, that's played out over the last several years. Um, creating different things within the auction, tiering the response rates, different economics for people who are on the market get, get rewarded through that. Those are the types of things I think we can do around the edges, particularly for the exchanges that have more medallions to work with where we can start to, to experiment and innovate on ways to bring into the market uh, tools and opportunities for, for the market makers to improve the, improve the markets. Actually, as you were talking, a question fl flashed up on the screen, and it's um, you know, around negative selection. So what should the exchanges be doing, or what should the industry be doing to kind of uh, help, the, help the market makers um, compete against um, you know, from, from HFT players or uh, technology shops that, uh, that are you know, maybe running a news bot or, or using AI to, to kind of go out there and bang the market when news happens. I mean, is that just part of our high speed, low latency trading marketplace or should, you know, should the exchanges be more active or, or provide more uh, risk protections, I guess it is, uh, for, for the market makers that you know, see the biggest losses when they get picked off or when there's a news item that pops, out, uh, pops into the market? As an exchange, we can only provide post-trade risk protections, not pre-trade risk protections. Um, it's not, there's not a lot the exchanges can do outside of major structural changes, you know, eliminating auctions and not necessarily condoning that, but those sorts of things to get more liquidity to trade on the, on the bid, displayed bid and offer. It's, it's, it's not our checkbook at risk, it's their checkbook at risk whenever these events happen. So with regards to things like the high-speed pickoffs and negative selection bias, the best I think we can do as an exchange, short-term at least, is provide the ability for the market makers to move their quotes as fast as possible, build post-trade risk protections in to help improve once you've made a first trade, get out of the way for the rest of the trades, go back to the, the, the premise that we're on the trading floor. And we'd be in a pit making markets on dozens, if not hundreds of options, and the first broker hits me on one option, I'm out on the rest of my quotes. I get to requote things. Build, build speed bumps like that, not necessarily slowing the market down, but the, build protections for the market makers that as they trade, they can, they can get out of the market instantaneously if they, if they need to. Along those lines, and there's actually another question that came up that says, what's the single best idea to improve the quote on the screen, and are you willing to support a pilot program? Um, <clears throat> Certainly, I think we would like to all say yes, we were willing to support a pilot program. The hardest part with implementing some of these changes, and there's a lot of changes we all understand, whether it's, okay, auctions, on the, you know, could we you know, eliminate or reduce auctions? Could we um, reduce access fees? Things like that. A single exchange can't do it. And while we can do it, it's not a successful business model, and we're all in business to, you know, again, to survive. The, idea behind supporting it is getting support from the marketplace. Exchanges have good ideas. Um, I'm sure a lot of the participants have good ideas. It's truly that we need the participants to hold hands with the exchanges when they do that. And many times the participants can't do it either because it hurts their own economics or their business model. Um, you know, we've all probably talked to the, the retail customers and you say, well, we should reduce, you know, uh, access fee caps, payment for order flow, make take fees. And they all say, it's a great idea. You say, well, if I do it, will you send your flow here? They say, no, I won't, because then I can't compete in my <laughs> space. So this is an economic problem, and it's a real issue of how we move forward. 
And again, forming a committee is difficult because of the, you know, we all form a committee and you've got that exact same dynamic going on. Uh, so we would need regulatory involvement and we may be able to get to that point if we can address those problems in a, uh, a very open and, and holistic manner. I'm not 100% sure how you do that. One idea that we've been kicking around that I'm going to like throw out to the, to the room to consider and I think we'll take to our advisory committee and maybe SIFMA can kick around is um, making all auctions and QCCs public on the tape. Um, for years we've published spreads. Um, you can go to the tape, you can see the little S indicator so you know it's part of a spread. But there's currently no way through, the, uh, through OPERA to see if a trade went up as a result of an auction or QCC. We think doing that um, might be a good first step, bringing more transparency into what's going on into the, in, in the space. Um, provides a whole new set of data that we have not had, at least at our fingertips, to see exactly what is happening in auctions, what is happening in QCC. Gives us some opportunity to see better about, better monitor some trade through things that we think may be happening, especially if a, if a trade goes up in an auction, trades through another exchange's market. And it also might help show and demonstrate, which is a good thing, that there is more liquidity in the market than it actually is, is demonstrated on the screens. So that's something that um, we'd like to move forward on. It. So let me, let me say something to that. So when we built Pixel, and we were against price improvement mechanisms years ago. We wrote comment letters, but we had to build Pixel, which was our price improvement mechanism on the Philex. We chose not to disseminate SPIM unless we needed to use the um, sort of the exception to the, to the law cross rule. Because why tell our competition what you know, what we're doing in that respect. So I just want to say to you now, as we have six, and I know that sometimes we show QCC and sometimes we don't, I just, I'm not quite sure. I will tell you, I think that's a great idea. And I think transparency would trump everything we're talking about here. So if we did that as an industry, sign me up. We will, I, th I think that's great because it does help disseminate that there is other liquidity out there. It gives the people a, a look, in, the participants a look into what's trading. And I, I vote yes. I, I agree. I think that transparency is important. The, the current mechanism through OPERA is quite antiquated. You can't mark something as both price improvement and complex. Okay. There's, there's so much more we can do. And it also seems like it's the only industry plan that we don't all partake in exactly the same. You can see the same spread go up on three different trading floors, and one's marked as buy right, one is spread, one is straddle. It just makes no sense. It would be great to, to modernize the, the whole opera spec in that regard. That yeah, regard. we're getting things done. <laughs> Transparently. I'm not being <laughs> negative. I'm trying to make certain that we can move forward. I think you, you brought up a great point. I think that liquidity, there is a lot of liquidity out there. We always hear there's no liquidity in the options market. That is absolutely not true. The problem is, is liquidity, A, isn't on the screen, and B, it's generally going to be deeper than that. I'll call it a retail quote. I mean, maybe we need to address the two-tiered quote problem. This, or this, should this be a two-tiered market? There's a very different liquidity picture for the order that's coming from a retail customer who, you know, we hear the term, oh, he's less informed. He's not less informed. They all have the exact same information as any institution. The difference is they're not a professional trader. They're not actively managing their trades. So therefore, they, they are a, a better, and, and they've also got multiple trades going on both sides. So they're constantly crossing, you know, going back and forth in the spread. Um, that known counterparty in that, that type of trade is a much uh, simpler trade for the market maker or the liquidity provider, and it's a much lower volume, so much lower risk. But the liquidity that we need for the institutions, and the institutions, and we've seen it, they continue to grow. Um, I was having a discussion with a, one of the guys at a bank yesterday, and he said the, op, the, the, the listed options market is absolutely cr critical to our structured products group. They lay their risk off in the listed market. Um, they, those guys are looking for liquidity. The problem is, is they can't see it on the screens, and that's difficult. Could we, could we go to a, a two-tiered market that's got like an RLP type program? where we've got a quote for retail and a quote for institutional. I think it's actually a good idea. The uh, regulators, so everyone in this room knows, don't like it at all. Do, don't, don't we already de facto have that? You have the auction oh. mechanism that's predominantly retail order flow. We do. The have problem is market. it's not displayed. The, exactly. the retail customer doesn't know their price, and the institutions don't either. It's kind of the worst of both worlds, to be quite honest with you. There I go being negative again. <laughs> no, I, I agree. <laughs> We've been hearing that consistently, through, not just at this conference, but coming into this conference. The, the, the default is to go to put your worst screen on your worst quote on the screen because you don't know who you're going to trade with. If there are things we can do with transparency, 
and identifying who, who market makers are going to be trading with, then that default could actually flip and their, their quote could be tighter and, 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 and bigger because they're, they're confident that who they're trading with is who they want to trade with. Well, I mean, I think the de facto segmentation piece is, is a relevant one in the sense that, you know, at the end of, at the, end of the day, the, the issue is that the market maker, even if their quote was extremely tight, may not actually have their quote actually get touched as a result of the fact that that, you know, that trade do, you know, de facto is going into an auction mechanism. And, and, and to be fair, I mean, obviously auctions serve a very viable purpose for you know, generating price discovery and everything else, but it's always true in terms of you know, what, is, what is balanced and what is reasonable, right? Something used to the extent of all else is, is, is unhealthy, right? And so the question then becomes is, is there a balancing point where if, you know, if the market is sufficiently attractive, then maybe you know, the auction isn't necessary in that particular you know, application, and then that, that displayed quote does get touched. Because, of course, the issue when we talked about pickoffs and speed, I and mean, part of it, though, too, is the fact that that displayed quote is only being accessed by, you know, to your point earlier, Andy, you know, a counterparty that is probably one that you were not desirous to trade with, right? And so to the extent that you had some subset of order flow that was actually touching that quote that was, you know, w was attractive, that helps subsidize the cost of, of that quote being out there, right? So you're blaming all the problems on auctions? That's not what I said. Balance and <laughs> moderation in all things, right. Andy. No, no, it just wasn't to you. It was to the, uh, to, to the panel. We really haven't talked about auctions, and I think the uh, auctions have, have been uh, beaten to death over the past couple of years, but, uh, you know, do we need to take a hard look at auctions again? Is it something that you know, the industry as a whole needs to, to kind of think through again, is it something that, uh, that could be part of the problem and potentially part of the solution for that matter? It would bring more, potentially more profitability back to the market makers if they know they could buy or sell on their quotes. But I think the bigger problem for the market makers who are providing liquidity is the fact that they can get hit across all the exchanges. Maybe the problem is the algos that are sweeping across all the exchanges. Any market maker, I believe, would be willing to trade in any of their quotes one time. But to get hit on 5, 10, or 15 exchanges simultaneously is, is where the liquidity problem comes and the huge negative selection bias. I think we've also got the problem with, you know, so the auctions have had a hard look taken at them. And just as recently as, uh, was it January, February, the regulators no longer allow auctions to happen in where there's no chance of price improvement. Now, there can be an argument around that, but I won't go into it. Um, so in penny wide, when, when the quote is a penny wide, you can't have an auction anymore. So we've stopped doing that. Um, that, I think, made a difference. But when they looked at it and said, okay, should we go further than that to kind of what you're referencing, you can't. You, Shelley's right, but the retail guys who are sitting in this room would say, Great, so my customer's gonna trade on a 14 cent wide market? They're not gonna trade. So we need to find a way to give the customer what would be a truly a fair price and allow them to, to trade in a market that's a, a liquid, retail-driven market without having an auction. The auction is what creates that two tiers you kind of referenced before. Um, is there a perfect, you know, do I have a solution? No, I've got ideas around it, and I think a lot of us, all of us do, and probably a lot of people in the room do, but. How do we get there? That's the hardest part. Well, I think there's, I mean, to your point, Ed, I mean, there's also a difference, too, between name 15 and name 75 as well in terms of what that experience is like. And, of course, there's an implicit opportunity cost when someone looks at that screen and then doesn't elect to trade either. So the question is, how do you make that name sufficiently attractive that you convert that person from who wasn't going to trade because they couldn't have visibility into what the actual price is into a trade? And I think then that, that means that there isn't sort of a one-size-fits-all solution, you know, in, you know, in the top 20 names or, or 30 names or whatever it may be, the, the answer may be different than servicing that next subset. And I think, you know, I think all of us would agree and kind of pointed to, you know, I think, Kevin, your point was like if we, if we sort of attack things serially with low-hanging fruit and you take this hill and then you take that hill, you can sort of evaluate things, you know, in, in a more iterative fashion, um, which I think makes sense. I also think it's worth pointing out, not all auctions were created equally. I mean, we have the complex order auction, which is really just a, a, a technology answer to what happened on the trading floors for years. When a spread comes into the market, the market makers, when they're trading, like, the, responding to a spread, they're generally going to tighten from what's on, on the bid-ask. That's all really our complex order auction does. 
our HAL mechanism and all the other exchanges that have a flash mechanism. That's a way for firms to find additional liquidity, uh, you know, uh, un, not on screen liquidity, and oversize their order flow to a certain exchange because they're through experiences uh, in their order routing, they know that there's more liquidity than it is on the screen. So just to say all auctions are bad or all auctions are good, I think we got to be careful. We've got to segment them and look at what each type of mechanism brings to the market and make sure that we, we, we work on the ones that we think are most detrimental. All right, so every market maker in the room is saying, yeah, and every one of those auctions takes away from the liquidity on the screen. That's, that's our problem, and that's the problem we need to face. Unless you only let those who are providing liquidity on the screen run the, participate in the auction. Agreed and disagreed. So that certainly helps, but it's not going to, um, a guy's not going to put a tighter quote on the screen that's accessible to that, that improper uh, you know, access to the market. No, it's not improper, the, the fast access to the market in so that he can participate in those retail auctions. He's, he, he, he will not be profitable, won't be a traded profitable trading model. That's, a, that's an, an issue with it. I'll, I'll just close this, or I'll let Andy decide whether it's closed. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll close my comment I'll on this. with question. No, I'm not taking that question. This is why I'm speaking now. So <laughs> you'll see the next question. This is, I, I would throw auctions and what we can do maybe in the bottom thousand stocks as the low hanging fruit. And I think we could come up and come to an agreement to try a couple of things in that bottom tier. And I, I would look forward to working with, with everyone on auctions in that maybe bottom thousand and figure some things out. R RFQ the bottom thousand and don't, yeah. That's, yeah, like, I mean, let's just talk about everything on the table, ideas, right? We can know, do a ton there. there. There's a lot it's of such a little amount of volume. That, we could, that could, I think, come to an agreement with the right kind of committee structure. So, Kevin, thanks for volunteering to chair that committee yeah. and add your co-chair. So, uh, you know, you know we really will. So. The, the, uh, yeah, the, the problem with that is, is that we, it goes back to my idea of conflict of interest. We all end up in, you know, obvious error was even hard to fight. Um, how, you know, the information that we were going to give out in, in the past, it's a really difficult thing for those committees to work well because, you know, as we all know, uh, you know to, to go down a path and do something quickly without study is, is fatal. But if we yeah. want to sit there and study it forever, it's, we'll never act on it. But I think we'll grow a ton of credibility and we'll show we're doing the right things and I think it can pay off. So we're, we're focusing, like I said earlier, on all these problems in the industry and they all, are, they all exist and there's no panacea. But I think if we show good faith to the market that we're solving things, then when we get a couple of those IPOs to come in at three billion and start to grow with us, when we see some volatility come back and all of a sudden we're doing 15 and a half million multiple listed equity options, and we've made some changes. We can claim victory, and I, I think we're in pretty good shape as an in industry. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is, this is a great industry with, with, you know, we provide a great service to the financial services industry throughout the world as far as hedging risk, transferring risk from one party to another to enhance yield, to provide insurance, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. You're absolutely right. I was just trying to get out of being the committee chair. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the question monitor, everybody can see, and I, it's, it's interesting watching the faces when they read the questions. But um, <laughs> So maybe we want to rethink what the panelists can see on, in terms of the questions. But, uh, you know, we'd be remiss unless we talked to this guy. And, and uh, it's been bounced around at, at various committees and, and within the industry. Um, the ORF fee, options regulatory fee. Um, do you guys have plans to improve the transparency of what's going on with that fee? Um, I'll go for and, it. And hold on, hold on. <laughs> part, part three to this question. Um, Shelly raised his hand. Yeah. <laughs> Are, uh, you know, is, do exchanges use the ORF fee as a subsidized way of creating a new market? And there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, being the l most recent exchange to launch. Um, I think there's a misconception about how the ORF is used by the exchanges. Uh, we just, again, opened the 15th exchange. We did implement a, an ORF fee on top of that. To, to ask the open exchange so you can capture the ORF fee is, is a crazy question. I'm sorry. But the, the, whole, the way the exchanges are all supposed to do this is look at what our true regulatory costs are, assign some percentage of that, and calculate the ORF. We imply an ORF from what the true regulatory costs are. So we open a second exchange. It doesn't double our regulatory cost. It doubles our cost at FINRA, but in terms of the internal um, infrastructure, the number of people on the reg team, it's a very small incremental amount. Um, 
the ORF is not big enough for any given exchange to cause an exchange to open. It's not a profit center. It covers a percentage of the regulatory costs. And what I would assume happens as we go forward with the parent consolidation, we haven't had true exchange consolidation, because we haven't emerged, all the exchanges stay open, but we will ultimately see, I believe, a reduction in the ORF from having those larger families because the incremental cost for each exchange, the second is a fraction of the first, the third is a fraction of the second, and that should drive the ORF cost down ultimately. The other thing I want to add is we have been working very closely with the SEC, being that we are the most recent ORF filing. Um, they've asked us to add a lot of transparency. There's a lot more detail in the most recent Pearl ORF filing. Uh, there's been some comment letters. We're working with both the SIFMA Options Committee and the SEC to try to make it more transparent. Whether or not all the exchanges charge it the same way, that is, again, something we can't talk about amongst ourselves. Uh, it would make sense from an industry perspective to try to standardize that, but we can't talk about fees. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just add, we, were, we bought the ISC last year, so there's the calculation of the ORF, and then there's what you throw in the ORF bucket as part of a regulatory expense. Both of those are pretty opaque or just unclear about the right way to do it. So we are, as Shelley is, we're working with the regulator, the SEC, to, to harmonize within ourselves our process of doing that. And then we're trying to get some clarity. And I would welcome any transparency we can all give as an industry to what should be in that bucket and what should not. I think we all benefit if there's extra transparency towards something as sensitive to ORF. I don't believe that it is our problem of why we're doing 14 and a half million options a day, but it's a cost. And if there's a cost that you're not being transparent about, then it just leads to you know, conjecture and, you know, and distrust. So I think we need to err on the side of being very transparent there, and we support that. Any other ORF comments, gentlemen? No. No, <laughs> okay. Um, a question popped up here, position limits. Um, uh, the current position limits are outdated and are being applied to broad-based ETFs, um, which many think are, are pushing a lot, of, uh, a lot of the business to OTC and, and, uh, and like markets, um, and, hurt, and it's hurting industry volumes. What, uh, you know, what is an industry should, uh, should you guys be doing as exchanges to, uh, to kind of address the, the position limit issues? I, I have to be honest with you, I haven't looked at them in a long time, um, and this is, this, this case, I remember when this came up years ago and we did address it and we got those position limits changed. Uh, this is something we need to work closely with the clearing firms, the regulators. Uh, it's not something that can't be changed. I think that, I'm not sure who asked the question, but I think it's a question any one of the exchanges would be welcome to get the phone call to say, hey, this is why we need to change them, this is what we're looking at, and can you guys help us address this? I think I. I Speak for myself, yeah. and I think everybody on the panel, we'd be more than happy to address those. Yep. And I'm, you know, I'm a, a bit embarrassed that I haven't looked at them in a while because I, quite honestly, thought when we had uh, made some some significant adjustments to them a few years back, that uh, that was still adequate for most of the firms. Yeah, I actually hope this is accurate, and I, I would welcome someone to reach out to us because if it's accurate, then it's it's something. It's an opportunity for us, to, for everybody in this room. To Absolutely, yeah, we can put this in the low-hanging fruit category. I think. Yep. And we've done a lot of work on our cash indices, and it, it takes time, but you, you can get it through. And we, now we actually don't have position limits in our cash, in our broad-based cash indices. We didn't start that way. So if this is an issue we need to address, then we Yeah, it actually it. came up in uh, the STA Options Committee yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so there is absolutely concern about it, and uh, I'm sure you'll hear from, uh, from some of those members. Um, Next question here, how much progress has, uh, has each exchange made towards uh, the previously mandated OCC risk controls? I'll, I'll speak for Everybody. Box. We've, we've instituted all of them and instituted them, um, and we, we actively reach out to our participants to uh, engage them to use them, because they're not forced to use them. They can use them at their choosing. Um, but uh, as far as I, I, I won't speak to the other exchanges, but I know that we've put every one of them in place and are seeing them operational and working very well in the marketplace. CBOE is the same. I mean, those are not mandated anymore. The OCC never got that filing approved, but we all used it as a, as a blueprint for what the industry should become, and I think all, our exchanges all have, uh, are in compliance with, with the suggested risk controls. 
Yeah, the same, the same is true with NYSE, but I think this is actually one of those, um, you know, this is a, a good, you know, this is a good story for the industry as well, which is over the last year, you know, the vast majority of exchanges, you know, everyone certainly speak up, but I mean, we've instituted a suite of risk controls across the board that just make it safer, per, you know, for participants to interact across all markets, which is, you know, which is a good story. And to the extent that you have um, higher levels of confidence um, in terms of managing your risk across those exchanges, that's a good thing. Also, to the extent that you don't see, you know, as, as large kind of events as you once did, um, that's also a good thing for, you know, instilling uh, investor confidence as well. So, we had all the protections in place actually before the OCC came out with their their request. Uh, some of them were optional, and we were we made them mandatory per the request. But we were a big fan and supported OCC both in the design of the request and following through with them. Actually, I'm going to just take this question a bit differently and you know, down a different path, but this is another good instance, though, of the industry in some ways overreaching, and OCC in this case, and when they mandated these risk controls, I don't think any of us would disagree they were a bad idea. I certainly never did. But the way in which they were, they were forced into the marketplace, that's some of the things that add cost. And while market makers say, well, we're, you know, or the participants are, we're getting cost added to us on and on. These are things that add cost to exchanges, and these are the things that stress exchanges to make certain they're in place. So you say, well, exchanges should have them anyway. Exchanges may be, you may be, these are the type of things that may be better off letting exchanges choose on a competitive level if you want to have them, because you can um, put things like these in that your participants may like, or you can have participants say, no, I, I do this well myself, I don't need it. Um, so I think the way that OCC had put, you know, had pushed this in place, and then, as Andy alluded to, it, it ended up getting repealed. It never even happened. They're, they're not mandated. They were, and we had to build them. But then at the last minute, the filing was pulled because it was, hey, they built it. We don't have to worry about it anymore. So it's, it was a very interesting way for a, a, uh, a, something to be pushed into the marketplace that uh, in many ways was wanted by some, but not by all. The, um, speaking of wanted by some, but not by all, the, uh, the cat system is uh, starting to make its way into the market and, and the, the costs are starting to, to filter out. Uh, Andy, I think you guys had a uh, filing last week talking a little bit about uh, the costs. You know, as exchanges, um, the, the CAT system, is that something front and center on your kind of technology stack over the next six to, to 12 months or has it been there? And is it, <coughs> again, this, this huge cost being layered on top of what you guys are doing? Well, we have a few technology initiatives at CBOE right now. Of course, we're in the process of migrating all of our tech, all of our exchanges over to the best technology. Um, but clearly, CATS is we're, it's on our it's on our radar. It's on our list. Um, we um, our work. Chris Isaacson, our CIO, has this as a project that he's planning on meeting deadlines on. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the current administration if it's something they're going to delay. But until we have certainty on that, we're going to stay. Stay on course with it. Um, next question is how many of you guys tweet? Because it I mean what what are you guys doing to court the millennials out there? And I, I know a couple of you guys aren't active tweeters, um, whatever <laughs> that means. Um, so what you know, again, what strategies obviously the, the, the younger generation coming up that are are a little bit passive in, in their strategies. What, what are you guys doing as individual exchanges as opposed to all the things OCC is, is doing, OIC is doing, uh, to court, court that new generation of trading? So I'll, I'll, I'll go first. We just built um, an unbelievable space in Philadelphia. I was sharing with Shelly, because we'd worked together in the past. And the space that NASDAQ invested in in Philadelphia is just out of this world. It's wonderful. It's a brand new state-of-the-art trading floor. It's, it's compact. And, but the workspace itself brings in maybe six to 10 NASDAQ businesses back to Philadelphia or in Philadelphia. And it's very, we're using this as, an, as an, the ability to court young organic growth within our, within our own NASDAQ enterprise. And we have bought Drexel and Penn's campus. We're working with the local universities there. We think it starts there. It continues, to get to your question, Andy, it continues with promoting the options business. We do a lot of this through Facebook Live. We work with Jill Malandrino. And we're out there. We're going to promote on, on expirations, which we now know are, are every week. But on the classic expirations, we're going to promote from the floor. We've seen a lot of followers. I'll, I'll just share, share one little anecdote about the followers. 
Uh, Tom, Dan Kerrigan, and I did a Facebook Live with Jill the day we opened our new space. And we were so proud of ourselves, we got 2,000 live viewers. And the little birds go flying by. And like, this is great, 2,000 people, Tom. We did great. And then later that day, we realized Jill had done a walk around through the trading floor. And we clicked on to see how many viewers she had without any of the NASDAQ personnel, 145,000. So honestly, the talent of Tom and me being on screen with Dan Kerrigan is not good. But, but we think <laughs> things like that can attract millennials. It starts small. But then working together, credibility, promotion, education, all those things, I think, are things we need to do. We have an app in the marketplace. It's uh, actually just relaunched. Um, it's, a, it's an on-phone tool. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure what the early adaption is, but clearly the numbers are growing. We have over 750,000 tweet uh, people receiving our tweets. CBU is very active in social media between tweets. We put out a regular blog that's actively watched. It's not just coming, it's not just information coming from CBOE, but we have several contributors um, putting out data about a trading that's happening on CBOE. Uh, we have a, an internship program that every year we bring in about 30 college kids into, our, into the CBOE, and we take the time every year to sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and get our, the, their read or, or their, their view of what we could do differently or what we could do for them that would put them in a better position to understand our, our product offering. And I think our investment in VEST kind of demonstrates our, our, our views towards where we need to go. VEST is, uh, we've talked about a little bit, but VEST is, is putting products in the market that allow people to, to really get the outcome that they're looking for. And in the world of passive trading and people looking for not necessarily how they get there, but just getting to where they want to get, a tool like Vest is, uh, or a firm like Vest and the things that they're doing um, probably meets or starts to look at uh, some of the things that the millennials are looking for. They won't let me have a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. How'd that be? <laughs> Doing Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, um, the OCC, OCC, should that be a industry utility or yes. a profit center? I thought the OCC was an industry utility. That's a, that, that's, curious to hear it's, feedback. It's, it's, a really, it's a really hard question to answer. I'll let you I think you and I might have a different answer than the yeah. rest on the panel. It's like a separate classes up there. <laughs> I guess it depends on if you're an owner or not. Um, I think it's best for the industry that it's utility. Uh, it wasn't originally designed to be a profit center, uh, but it has become potentially a competitive issue amongst the exchanges. Okay. Um, Nobody else? <laughs> You're not going to hear any comments on that one. Sorry. <laughs> Pregnant silence. Um, this uh, is kind of uh, a question that, uh, that I was thinking about before when we talk about auctions and, and some of the challenges with current market structure. Um, you know, if you guys could roll back, and this is for everybody, you can't not answer this one, guys. Um, if you could roll back one structural shift or change that, uh, that you've seen in your illustrious careers, uh, what would that be? Eighths and quarters. <laughs> 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 We have to, I'm sorry. Go, I was just okay. I'll go first. I, I honestly think something I spoke to earlier would, in fact, help the markets, which is a, uh, and I'm not saying exactly how, but a, a two tiered market, a market that we allowed for a, a separate quote um, and separate operational functionality to access the retail, the retail space, and then a separate liquidity quote, deep liquidity quote for the uh, institutional space. It's a difficult problem because then how do you define who's who? How do you allow access? So I'm not saying that's a, uh, um, something that we could solve overnight or do. And as I mentioned, the regulators aren't a fan of it because it really goes against the act. But at the same time, I think it would help our marketplace and I think it would also go to uh, how do we engage the millennials? How do we get them to trade more? They're much more technologically savvy. They're going to be much more engaged in a marketplace that has a very um, healthy ability to show them what the market really looks like. We have to figure out a way to incent the market makers. It's their credit card that's at risk every day. They want to make markets. They want to trade. How can we provide the best risk protections for them, allow them to be profitable? It seems like we're the only industry in this country that it's, it, there's a perception that it's bad if you buy it wholesale and sell it retail. 
they're, they're, providing, they're providing value to the marketplace. And the firms that are complaining, the spreads are too wide, there's not enough liquidity. We have to maintain the ability for the market makers to earn a return on their capital that's relative to the amount of risk they're taking. And they have a vibrant marketplace. We have to figure out how to help that problem. So what, is, what do you roll back to, to make that happen again? Eights and quarters. Eights and quarters. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, penny pilot's a problem. There's way too many, my, my, hum, my not so humble opinion, there's too many classes in the penny pilot program. We should try to scale that back. Um, the auctions are a problem. That's something we have to work on together as an industry. Uh, any one exchange can make a move and it'll just cost a market share at this point. Uh, it's, it's a difficult problem to solve. And then how do we handle the predatory trading that's occurring? Just one, Shelley, just one. Sorry. <laughs> you took them all. I think most of our changes have actually been pretty good. They just need to be modernized. We need to modernize the market structure. And I, I think if we had VIX at 27, I'm not wishing VIX a whole lot higher than that. I think that's a sweet spot. Give me VIX at 27 and give me some private companies to come public a heck of a lot faster than they do today. And I think we're, we're halfway there. I would like to see, I, I would have liked to see a more consistent sort of policy-based approach to the way in which auctions function from the perspective of, you know, a price improvement auction should be something that you should be able to explain, you know, to a 10-year-old kid, right, which is, it's an auction, and this is particularly in under 50 lots, but it's an auction that requires price improvement. You just don't start off on the tips and disenfranchise a quote, right, because there's a circular reference that that creates. So, I mean, from that perspective, I think having, you know, having a consistent sort of policy-based, you know, based approach to that and, you know, something that incorporates just rewarding good market making on, on the screens, that would have been something that I would have liked to see. I would think one thing I wish had been done earlier and better and more consistently was the education of, 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 of the investing community. We're in a great spot now. Frank did a great job yesterday of explaining what OIC is doing. But it took us a long time to get there. And I think if we had, if we had been more um, strategic and as an industry of how we pre pre um, purview to the, to the investing public, I think many of the issues that we're facing today, looking for growth and the relatively small adoption of options in, in, in the retail and institutional space, is something, looking back, we could have been further along if we had done a little bit better in that space. Uh, along that vein, how do you grow liquidity? Is it tighter markets? Is it incenting liquidity providers? Is it bringing new, more institutions into the marketplace, or is it simply a matter of volatility coming back to our marketplace and, and kind of going from there? Those are all factors that matter. I don't know if there's any one particular one more than the other. Uh, better liquidity on the screen would be helpful. A little vol would help. Yeah, well, you know, some volatility we can't control, that's the problem. But um, it, it goes back to what I said earlier. I don't think it's a, it's a liquidity problem. I truly believe we've got good liquidity out there because there's a lot of firms, while they may have not actively make markets or be registered market makers are willing to commit capital and in fact provide that liquidity. It's just a question of, uh, Shelley reference, getting it on the screen. I think that's the, that's the big piece there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you have to incentivize liquidity. You can't legislate liquidity. And our market making firms and, and other firms that are not market makers but are in the markets to trade, are in, they want to make money, so they want to trade. I think sometimes it's sort of just a conundrum of, well, it's not that busy. So I'm not going to display a lot of liquidity. But seldom do I hear when something does get busy and stay busy that there's not enough liquidity. Almost never. So. Um, we have a question that popped up. Are you concerned about Rule 871M and its potential to subject offshore investors to having taxes withheld on dividends they never received? And will it have a negative impact on volumes from uh, your guys' perspective? We need John Fennell. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I think this is another one of those things we all, of course, would agree yes. that, yeah, we are. Um, the, the, the new tax structure as it's being put forward also has a lot of other negatives in it that the, uh, the, all of us take that political fight to Washington. We make certain that we get engaged with them. We stay in front of the, uh, not only the committees, but also the decision makers at those levels. So all of those taxation issues, and they, are, they arise every year, and they're certainly very strong in every new uh, administration that comes in. Um, we have to stay focused on that, uh, the political action committees, as well as um, 
a number of uh, the, the lobbyists that are down there doing that work uh, is imperative. And, uh, you know, OCC has always done a great job of it, and uh, a lot of the exchanges have. So it's a, something we're always concerned about. I was on the Hill a few weeks ago, and I will tell you, NASDAQ invests a lot with, with making the time commitment and getting in front of the Congress to educate them. But when we were down there, we heard a lot of good things about this industry. Everyone up here is, is very engaged, as well as OCC. So I feel pretty comfortable. We have to stay vigilant with those types of things, but I think that we're in good shape there. Yeah, the coalition has been doing a lot of good work on both 871M and also the potential tax reform as well. Yeah. So it's just, I, it's just a difficult to evaluate the, the tax reform one because a lot of, there are a lot of moving parts, and so trying to um, understand it in a vacuum can be a little bit challenging because there are all these other factors that have direct impact onto it as well. So, but a lot of work's being done. The, um, I guess one of the things I wanted to touch on uh, before we close out here with, with the minute or so left, um, you know, is it time to take a hard look at our market structure? Do we need a, as you mentioned before, some sort of MSAC committee? Is it, you know, time for the SEC or, or uh, you know, the industry to, to kind of come together and perhaps have a concept release on what's wrong, what's right, and what needs to be fixed and, and potential solutions? Uh, to our industry, and uh, you know, I'm not a big proponent of, of regulation. I, I, I kind of like the light touch approach. Mm -hmm. But is it time to really take a very hard look at the options industry from a structural perspective, as, as far as regulation goes? Just two cents from you guys on it. Close out. I, I would say I think we all like to think that we're anti-regulation. Oh, good, there's less regulation, but we need regulation. We need the right regulation. So I, I'll go back to what I've said a few times. Let's modernize the market structure. Let's reimagine the regulatory framework, and let's think about the long term of this business. They'd be my three. Yeah, yeah and, and let's face it, the market structure as it exists today, even though it's got its share of issues, um, is, is very strong, and there's a lot of positives to it. There's a lot more positives than negatives. We've got a very successful asset class here, and um, we need to always be looking at market structures. How can we improve it? What can we do? Um, and, and these discussions are very helpful to forward that. So I think it's always a, uh, something we have to stay uh, vigilant in as well. I think the transparency and discussion is a good one. I think that holistic review sounds good in, in the most academic sense of it, but is somewhat more difficult to apply in practice. And so when you think about it, if you can you sort of look at it relative to the equities markets, um, where a lot of review is being done there, um, they're, they're two different animals. Their market structures are different, and their market structures have, have evolved as a result of, of different, different factors, right? On the equity side, it's much more of a, a regulatory evolution, whereas on the options side, a lot of the market structure has been driven uh, by industry change, right? And so when you look at the holistic review on the equity side, you think about NMS and how that takes into account a number of moving parts, and so you can't just adjust one without thinking about all the consequences to the other requisite parts of, of that entire, you know, component structure, right? Whereas on the option side, I feel like we can think about things in a more serious and strategic fashion, like what we talked about here, where, you know, you take the first hill and then you take the second hill and, and, you, and you iterate more quickly. Because I think the holistic review is, is also good, but challenging because it's very hard to build consensus around a lot of broad and sweeping changes, whereas it's, it's, it's easier to build consensus around a proposal at a time. So understanding the differences between the equities and options markets and kind of what's going on in those conversations I think is important to consider. Good place to start. Well, I've got a red light blinking, and uh, I'm not sure what happens if you don't yeah. stop. So. It's going the other way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'd like to thank you guys uh, today for, for doing this panel. I'd appreciate the, the time, and thank you all. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Questions worked really well, didn't they? Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. See you later. Let's go. Kevin. Thank you. Okay, time for a 30-minute break. Uh, please visit the attendee lounge, support our exhibitors and sponsors, and we'll see you back here at 11. Thank you very much.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 